Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to History 1301, The America of Jackson, Part 1 of 3. Uh, this stems from basically the 1820s to 1848 and ends with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago, which was in 1848. So what we'll be talking about in this part of uh, the America of Jackson is antebellum slavery. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, the Jackson administration itself. Uh, I'll have a few things to say about uh, the compromise, uh, the Missouri Compromise. And so from that, I'll go on and talk about Industrial Revolution. It'll be by steam, which is by sea and by land. Uh, I'll have a lot to say about how the, what the cost of that it was. It was on human beings. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about the growth of cities. And then uh, on the part three of one, part three of the three parts, it'll be a manifest destiny. In other words, we've got to grow America. We'll talk, uh, we'll pick up where we left off with the Louisiana Purchase. Then we'll go through um, uh, Zebulon Pike and his uh, explorations in the 1820s. And then we'll get Texas into the Union. And then we'll talk about the Mexican War of 1848 and end with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago. So for those of you guys who are looking forward, looking ahead, when we get to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago, that's when I'll stop and have another test. That's when we will stop and have another test. So I'll be sending you out emails. If you're uh, doing this online, I'll be sending you out emails for that. So with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and get, uh, get, get, get cracking. Let's get on with it then. So what we're going to talk about now, the first thing we need to talk about in the age of Jackson is we need to talk about antebellum slavery. Now we've talked about colonial slavery before and colonial slavery. Again, I'm going to do, uh, make the same approach then as I am now, which is to say that the moral issue is clear. We have to make this an economic issue. That way we can actually follow it and try to figure out what's going on with slavery. So when we talked about uh, colonial slavery, if you need to go back and get a refresher, you know what to do. Just go find it online, uh, find the appropriate uh, presentation, go take a look at that again. It was an element of the triangular trade. And so what was bringing the slaves to the new world was sugar and then rum. And so we just had to follow the money. Well, once again, we're going to follow the money here. So we're just narrowing our focus instead of a triangular trade. By the time frame we're talking about in the well into the 1800s, as you know, Great Britain had shut off the Atlantic trade, but America was still maintaining slavery. So once again, the moral issue is clear. We just need to follow the money. So the first bullet point that you see up there. Let's discuss that for a minute. I'm sorry, the second bullet point that you see up there. So America had been cut out of the triangular trade in the aftermath of the American War of Independence. And we've talked about that. The Treaty of Paris, 1783, had cut us out of the triangular trade. And so our economy was suffering. Please make sure you t take a strong note here. We're picking up on this issue of slavery from that point. And since we were cut out of this triangular trade, those ships from the Caribbean were not coming up to the colonies, now the United States, and getting truck vegetables. In return for that, they had been dropping off molasses that was getting turned into rum or sugar to eat. And we've talked about that. And then all the truck vegetables were going back down to the Caribbean to feed those slaves that were down there. Well, that part of the triangular trade is now dead. Britain had cut us out of that. Subsequently, of course, as you know, in the 1810s, they're going to end the slave trade and emancipate all the slaves. But that does not concern us here. What concerns us is that those slaves then had nothing to do. They were not growing truck vegetables for sale in the Caribbean, and they were not turning molasses into sugar to eat and rum to drink. They weren't doing that. So you had a significant labor force, over 600,000. Again, that should already be in your notes. That had exactly nothing to do. Now, I want to be clear on something. The most brilliant men in American history had no idea how to actually end slavery in America. You had a labor force that was huge in the South, almost all in the South. And nothing for them to do. There was no product for them to make. Well, then there was nothing to do with that labor force. In other words, think it all the way through. 
Now, in a face-to-face -face class, I'm usually trying to draw people into a conversation. Here, obviously, that's not possible. But I want you guys to be thinking, how would you personally solve it? If you had a labor force of people that were otherwise undesirable, to be quite blunt, they were of African heritage. And so nobody wanted them around. The white people didn't want them around. They were racist even back in those days. But the moral issue is clear. We're talking about the economy now. What do you do with a labor force that is otherwise undesirable, and they are, they are held as slaves, you own them, and you have no work for them to do? In other words, you're suddenly faced with an extremely um, intense labor surplus, and it's really, really sudden. Now, politically, as you all well know, the Jay Treaty, and I've talked about this, we were trying to get the triangular trade restarted again, but the British weren't having it. They were still very childish and, and very petty about the American War of Independence. Fine. But our guys had no way to, like, solve what to do with the slaves. And so how could you reemploy them? Well, sometimes I'll get people who say, well, you just, like, put them back to work. Well, put them back to work doing what? Um, President Washington, now, he didn't personally own slaves technically. In other words, he had a lot of slaves, but they were actually came from his wife, um, Mary Custis, that was her name. Her, her maiden name was, I'm sorry, Martha. Martha Custis, that was her maiden name was Custis. And they were one of the richest families in Virginia. And so when George Washington married Martha, all the slaves, she brought all the slaves with her as part of her dowry, as part of her marriage. But he tried to say, okay, well, we'll grow an extra uh, wheat and extra other grain crops and then turn that into whiskey and then we'll sell a bunch of whiskey we'll sell alcohol and that worked for a while but he was always trying to figure out what to do with the slaves they had they they just couldn't sustain the 70 or 100 slaves that he had he just couldn't do that uh, jefferson did the same thing he struggled and struggled with how what to do with all the slaves he didn't know what to do so you can't just you can't just cut them loose in other words emancipate them because if you did it and everybody else did it, then you'd have you know 600,000 black people walking the roads with nothing to do. So that was not an option. You couldn't find other employment for them because there was no other employment. Everybody else was already doing that. In other words, when Washington was trying to like uh, produce whiskey, everybody else had turned to that resource as well. And so the price of whiskey collapsed and couldn't make it anymore. So, uh, well, what about sending back to Africa? Well, if the federal government was going to send them back to Africa, think it all the way through. First, that was going to be extremely expensive. These slaves, these unfortunate individuals, were owned by somebody. So the price of the slave was really, really low because there was like they were an additional labor source. They were surplus labor. But the minute the federal government said, okay, we're going to buy up all your slaves and give you a flat rate for them and send them back to Africa, first... Suddenly, the price of the slaves went up. All the Southerners were want a whole lot of money for their slaves. They're just trying to gouge the government. Second, to raise all that money, you'd have to go to the Northeast and tell them you're going to raise a bunch of taxes so you can pay for all these slaves down the South and then send those poor individuals back to Africa. In the North, they were not going to do that. In effect, you're going to make the federal government slave owners. You're going to make the federal government a slave-dealing government, and nobody was going to put up with that. Then you have to get a bunch of ships and send them back to Africa. Well, by this time, most of the people, these, these unfortunate slaves, they'd been born either in the Caribbean or they'd been born in America. They had no meaningful connection on a sociological level in Africa. So, in other words, you're going to take these people, put them on ships, send them back to Africa, and then just dump them on the beach? Well, that's not going to work. They would they would die. They would be re-enslaved. They would be, you know, nothing, that's not going to work. And so there was just, you know, there was no solution to it. So slavery was a dying institution. Between the end of the American War of Independence, 1783, and 1800 or so, for the purpose of this class, 1800, slavery was a dying institution. Madison said so. Washington said so. Jefferson said so. All these Southerners were like, at the end of the witch trying to figure out what to do with the slaves. But then along came a guy named Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney. Now, this is the guy. So this, again, is an economic argument. So let's use economic language. 
The demand then is for an inexpensive and durable textile. And the supply is going to be to cotton. Now, when I talked about um, triangular trade slavery, when I talked about um, colonial slavery, I told you guys again and again and again, cotton is not on your list. That is not on your list. And here's the reason why. For those of you guys who have ever seen cotton in the field, which is probably like none of you, cotton is a really uh, is not a very tall plant. It's only about, I don't know, 18, 20 inches tall. And when the cotton forms as the plant is growing, it forms in what's called a bowl, B-O-L-L. -L. And then when the cotton is ripe, the bowl opens up. And it's like the petals of a flower. But the, the petals, as it turns out, then this bulb, this bowl, B-O-L-L, -L, the petals are really thick and they're like covered with stickers. And then the cotton ball, B-A-L-L, -L, is inside that. Well, inside the cotton ball are seeds. And these seeds are like tangled up in the fibers of the cotton. So the first thing you have to do is like get the cotton up and growing. And for those of you guys who don't know, because most of you are not in an agricultural uh, environment, cotton is like really, really hard on the soil. Um, I actually come from a farm community, and we made money. Every time we ever planted cotton, we made money. But I hated that stuff. Man, cotton, it's, it's horrible. It's really hard on the soil. It's difficult to harvest. Everybody gets allergies. I don't really suffer from allergies. But that stuff gets everywhere. It's, it's just miserable. But we made money on it every time we planted it. But the point here is that the seeds are in the cotton ball. And so to get the seeds out of the ball, the, the, the people that are like doing it, the slaves, that sit down and like pull all the seeds out manually, which is extremely hard business, it's hard work to do. And so it took a slave all day to produce a pound of usable lint. Well, with a pound of usable cotton, that's... It's, it's, it's like a, it's a considerable volume, but it only weighs a pound and you can't do anything with it. Then you still have to spin it in a cloth and then turn it into something. But it was just not, it was so labor intensive that cotton was extremely expensive to use. An example of that, before the cotton gin came along and made cotton inexpensive, more about that in a minute, cotton was usually reserved for like wedding dresses. It was extremely expensive to use. So again, we're still talking about the demand side here. What people usually wore then was linen, which is a species of grass that's like, you know, you, you, you harvest the grass and then you put it in water and let it soak for a long, long time. Then you dry it out, then you pound it, and then you like separate out all the fibers and you turn it into linen. And actual linen is actually kind of hard to get these days. Like nobody makes that stuff anymore because it's really hard to do. It's very labor intensive. But then somebody you know, centuries ago came up with what they call linsey woolsey. So in the warp, you're going to use a linen, and the weft, you'll use wool. And so you get the durability of the, and the softness of the linen, but you also get wool, which has its own you know, positive properties, mostly because it's like really, really cheap. It grows on sheep, obviously. Well, the problem with that process is it's kind of expensive, and you have to wear wool all of the time. Now imagine wearing wool, especially in the South. It's heavy, it's hot, it's itchy, ah, it's, and, and it's just, you know, there's a lot of bad things that are going on with wool, but people have been wearing that stuff for centuries and centuries. So cotton is really, really super desirable. Uh, think of all the properties of cotton as a textile. It's light, it's durable, it takes a dye really well. There's lots and lots of advantages to it, and it grows really easily out in the field. Again, it's expensive on the soil, and it's hard to process, and that's what makes it expensive. But once you actually have the cotton, you can use it for all sorts of stuff. And again, think of the demand. It's not just clothing. This is the age of sail. So you can use cotton as sails for a ship. Well, even a small ship required like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square yards of cloth for all the sails. So the demand is unlimited. But the supply is limited because it took so much time and effort to process the stuff, to get the seeds out. Then along come Eli Whitney. Now, again, for the purpose of this class, he patented it and made it more widespread, probably about 1798 or so. But for the purpose of this class, let's go with 1800. 
in about 1800, Eli Whitney is going to invent and develop the, the cotton gin. Gin, in this case, it's short for engine. And it's in that illustration that you see in the lower, um, what would it be, lower right. It's just these kind of blades, and it's on a crank, and you just crank the thing. You can kind of see, see it in that illustration just above, and the one on the left. And you just crank this thing. You feed the cotton in on the one side, and all the seed goes out the bottom, and you get processed cotton out the other side. And so, instead of having one slave taking a full day to make a pound of lint, even with a small cotton gin, you can process hundreds and hundreds of pounds of that stuff a day. And later on, they'll make really big gins, cotton gins, cotton engines, I guess I should say. And then they'll hook it up to a steam engine. And then you can produce the stuff by the thousands and thousands of pounds. So, you know, the plantation owners will pitch in. You'd put one engine out there on, one, on somebody's plantation, and then everybody would get all their cotton gin at one place. And that drove the cost of cotton way, way down. Please write that down. The, invent of the, the invention of the cotton gin meant that cotton as a product suddenly became very, very affordable. A product that you had an unlimited demand for suddenly became very, very inexpensive. Now, getting it out of the field is still labor intensive. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, it's not until after World War II in the 1950s that a machine that can pick cotton is actually invented. Until the 1950s, you still saw black people out there in that fields in those fields picking that damn cotton. And it's back-breaking work. You have to bend way over. It's hot. Uh, the cotton plant is like covered with millions and millions of little bitty tiny needles. And so you've got to pluck that stupid ball out of the bowl. And so by the end of the day, your hands are just like ragged. Then you've got to turn over the soil and do all the soil preparation and get more cotton planted for the next year. But once you get the cotton out of the field, the cotton itself, the fibers, are like really, really valuable. And then the seeds can be ground up and used for cattle food. Cattle absolutely go nuts over cotton seed. Or you can press the stuff and use cotton seed oil. It's also very valuable. So as a plant, it's very, very useful. Again, hard on the soil and hard to get harvested. But that's what you use your slaves for. So the, invent, the invention of the cotton gin makes slavery pay as a labor force. I have it on there with a different bullet point marker. It's bolded, it's italicized, and it's underlined. In other words, many of you learned about Eli Whitney and the cotton gin back when you were in grade school or middle school. But what they probably did not tell you is that this makes slavery pay. You have a product that, of unlimited demand that's very, very useful, but it's hard to harvest. And that's what the slaves are for. One other thing that's important here is that cotton only grows in the south. There are varieties now that will grow a little bit farther north, maybe in the north Texas panhandle. That's where my farm is at. And so uh, it'll grow up into there. But those were only new varieties. I'll have a map up in a little while, and it will show right exactly where the cotton belt is at. It's in the deep south, north of South Carolina, Georgia, the Florida Panhandle, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, parts of Arkansas maybe. There's a few other places, southern Tennessee, and that's where you can grow cotton, the deep south. So that made slavery pay. The whole purpose of this slide is to show that pay, slavery is going to pay. Before 1800, it did not pay. It was a dying institution. After 1800, with the invention of the cotton gin, slavery as a labor force will pay. And that's going to lead, I'm telling you right now, that's going to lead to a lot of problems going forward. So now that we have the economy of it, like, worked out, let's continue to uh, move on, and we're going to talk about our thesis statement, and we're going to get the South, we're going to start talking about the South's case. Okay, so with the background in mind, let's talk about antebellum slavery. Antebellum slavery from 1800 to 1860. Antebellum means, in Latin, before the war. Antebellum, anti-before, bellum, the war. 1800 to 1860, antebellum, before the war. So, what case did the South make? 
Now, I want to be clear on this, and I, I don't mind telling you guys this plainly and unambiguously. These discussions that I have about slavery are the most, I'm the very, very sensitive about this. Because we're talking about an issue that has, still has a very strong um, moral connotation to this very, very day. And a lot of people are like really, really upset about this issue, and they're trying to figure it out. But the moral issue is clear. Slavery is bad. Slavery is evil. I'm a fiery abolitionist. I hope all of you are fiery abolitionists. But the moral argument, as I said before when we talked about um, colonial slavery, the moral argument does not explain it. In other words, if you say, all right, well, slavery is bad. Well, okay, as an explanation, now what? Well, slavery is bad. Okay, that's the opposite of good. Got it. But how does that explain it? So to explore the issue of slavery, to explain it, we have to use an economic argument. And if there's one thing I hate about this whole discussion more than anything else, we have to turn these human beings who are being bought and sold for profit into an economic product. And I don't like that. But our thesis statement is exactly what I said. What case does the South make? Not what case do I make? What North, what, not what case the North makes. We'll get to theirs in a minute. Their case is going to be entirely a moral case. We have to figure out what case the South makes. And they are going to have a very, very difficult time articulating this idea. In other words, they've got to overcome the moral objections. And to do that, they've got to make slavery sound like it's good. Well, slavery is not good. It's evil. Yes? So as we go through this, understand that I'm not trying to make a case for slavery. I'm trying to explain what case the South made. We have to try and figure it out. Here's the reason why we need to figure it out, ladies and gentlemen. The Civil War, please make a note here. The Civil War, 1860-1865, will be fought over slavery at a cost of nearly 700,000 killed in action, another million or so wounded, and another million or so die of disease. And that's an extremely expensive lesson. But what we're trying to like decide in the Civil War is the issue of slavery. Are we going to be a nation that is going to be of free people, or are we going to be a nation that's going to hold on to slaves? And the South said we're going to be a slave nation. And the North said, well, no, we're not. We're going to free those people. And so 700,000 dead, a million wounded, a million died of disease. That was an extremely expensive lesson. And the South wanted to hold on to their slaves. So we have to try and figure out what the South's case was. What case did they make? Because they're going to go to war over slavery. Don't let anybody on TV or anybody else on YouTube or anybody else anywhere ever say anything other than that. The Civil War was fought over slavery. Full stop. That's it. The South said so. All right? So we never, we've got to figure out what case the South makes. Now, for that, so let's start delving into this. For that, we have to understand that the South, their labor force, not entirely, and we'll get into that as we go through this, but the backbone of their labor force is slaves. That's how they made their economy work. Their economy, and again, I'll talk about this later on. I'll have some slides that have uh, bar, bar graphs on it. This slide was like 65, the South was like 65 or 70 percent of their economy was based on agriculture. And the agriculture, in turn, is based on cotton. So let's take a look at some of these images. Uh, the image there on the uh, upper left and the lower left, uh, those were painted by a, a famous painter named William Aiken Walker. Uh, the paintings themselves are kind of naive. He's almost a formula painter. In other words, you see the same images again and again and again. Uh, William Aiken Walker was uh, born before the Civil War in the 1830s. He grew up in the South. He's from South Carolina. Uh, he was active in the Civil War as a Confederate soldier. Evidently, he was wounded in action at Seven Pines. But he was also a natural artist, as you can see here. And he painted these images of the South. Now, as a, a matter of art sort of analysis, you can kind of see what's kind of going on here. Again, you see this image again and again and again. Big giant fields of cotton, 
There will almost always be a wagon in it. The wagon will be loaded with cotton bales. Very often there will be a guy right in the middle of the photograph, right, like looking right at the um, artist. And that is the plantation owner. And you can see him in both of these images. And there he is pointing out there at the fields and pointing at all of his stuff. And he's saying, this is my stuff. Now, there's nothing odd about this. In other words, um, plantation owners back in those days very often hired painters to do landscape artistry in order to demonstrate their stuff. The age of photography was just then beginning, and the idea of taking a photograph of a great big giant farm was like, you know, this kind of alien. Plus, it's all black and white, and it was very expensive, and you couldn't get very good results out of it. But you could get an artist like Aikens to come along there, Aikens Walker, and to come along there and, and do this big giant painting. And wow, it'll like hang up on your wall and you'd say, this is my stuff. So you can kind of make the, the case that these are trophy photographs. These are trophy paintings. But within that, let's take a look at this and do some image analysis. You guys know how I feel about that. So slavery was evil. And to be clear, none of the slaves wanted to be slaves. Nobody wanted that. The slaves want to be free. They want that. They're very clear about it. So let's see what the South case was. And to do that, let's use some image analysis. So take a look at either one of these. And you see that in either one of these two paintings that I'm talking about, the one on the upper left and the lower left, there's only one or two white people right there in the foreground Again, the owner, and he's pointing out there at the field saying, this is all my stuff. And he's surrounded by all these slaves, these Africans, these people of African descent. And so there's like one guy and maybe 20 or 30 African Americans or African people, slaves. So if slavery was as bad as the North would have us believe, more about that in a minute, then how can that happen? How can one guy own all these people and then they not like killing? Again, more about that sort of thing later on. Slave rebellions. We'll talk about that in a minute. Well, so the question I have up on the board with that first bullet point. The slaves are the labor force and they're skilled and they're very, very valuable. You can see them out there doing all the work. So how does that one guy incentivize those slaves to do the job? Now, the obvious answer is violence. And I want to be clear. Coercion, and I have it up there. It's what the, the fourth bullet point. Coercion is a tool, but it's only as the last resort. It's only the last resort. Coercion, violence, that threat is always, always, always there. And slaves were beaten. But how can one guy, in this case, a guy with a you know older guy with a white beard, how can he incentivize all of those people to do all that work? In other words, is it possible that you could beat all slaves all day every day? Well, the numbers won't bear that out. Again, more about that in a little bit. But let's just like think about this. How do you get those slaves to do what they need to do? How do you incentivize them? Now that's a skilled workforce. They're out there doing their thing. Again, take a look at the image. It's not just a bunch of people out there picking that damn cotton. They are. But they got the cotton into the field. In the background, you can see that smokestack in the background and, and that steam coming out of you know one of, those, one of the smokestacks. That's the powerhouse that's running the cotton gin. Further in the background, you can see a ship out there uh, on the Mississippi River. And that's your transport system. That's how you're going to get your cotton to the market. Between the people in the foreground and the background, you can see that kind of uh, uh, that, that tan color up there. That's a field full of corn, a food crop. So here we have a farmer with a very, very prosperous farm. He's making money, a plantation, with, what, 20, 30, 40 people in there working for him? Certainly they're slaves, but he's very, very prosperous. So again, this is a very, very skilled and valuable workforce. Take a look at the wagon. It's hooked up to, what, three mules? Okay, I don't know how many guys have ever hooked up a mule team. But it's not as easy as you think. Mules do not want to be hooked up. They know what's about to happen to them. They don't like it. They're quite capable of biting and kicking. So you got to, like, hook them up to the wagon. 
and you've got to go through all this harness, and you have to like get them all ready to go. And so then you've got to get everybody out in the field, and they've got to do what they have to do. Then you have an engine man running the gin, and he's got to do what he's got to do. And then you've got to get all this stuff put into big giant presses and then bailed up, and those guys have to do what they got to do. And so there's a huge amount of work going on right in front of you, a vast amount of work going on, hard, backbreaking, miserable work. How do you incentivize these people? So this is how it works. Imagine, if you will, you get up in the morning and you go out there and you say, okay, folks, get everybody up out of bed, get them moving. Now you're going to tell the boss, and they're called slave drivers. You tell the driver, okay, get everybody ready to go. Sure enough, it's 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, and you tell all the women, ladies, go out there and get a big giant breakfast going. I'm going to talk to the guys. We're going to get it all laid out for the day. And the ladies go out there and they start cracking some eggs. They start getting some grits going. They start fixing some food. And you tell the guys, gather around. Okay, here are the things we need to do. We're going to get this field cleared off. We're going to get that field cleared off. We're going to get some stuff down to the docks. We have all these tasks that need to be done. And the minute those tasks are done, take the rest of the day off. That's how you incentivize your people. The minute... All the jobs that are, need to be done today are done. Take the rest of the day off. You incentivize them with time off. So immediately, the slaves are like, okay, well, these are the things we got to do. Well, let's get them done. Because I'm telling you right now, in the South especially, by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you want to be in and out of the sun. It's going to be hot from noon to uh, 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but you got a lot of work to do. It's just the nature of farm work. Farm work is backbreaking. It's hard. It's never-ending. I've done it, and it's not easy. And I had machines to do all the work. But you don't want to be out there after about 4 or 5 o'clock. That's when it really gets hot. That's when the day really, really does get hot. The heat of the day is 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon when the air has had plenty of time to like really get steaming hot. So when all that's done, you want to be inside. It's okay to be gin in that cotton. Because again, the machine does the work, but you're in the shade. Or husking out a bunch of corn, or pounding up a bunch of wheat, or doing something else. You want to be inside. You want to be up underneath the tree. You want to be inside, out of the flame and heat of the sun. So the slaves are well incentivized to do the job. If they get the job done, they take the rest of the day off. So, the next bullet point there, listen to the slaves. You have to listen to your labor force. And I can't overemphasize this. Everybody in the South who talks about slavery, uh, at the time, all the contemporary uh, uh, records, and a lot of people wrote about this. A lot of people wrote about this. I do a lot of homework for this. I read those things. Some of them are really, really unsavory, and you don't really want to discuss it. And it's not pleasant homework to do. But I've read all these accounts. And they would say again and again and again, yeah, we've got to listen to your people. So one of the mechanisms that slaves would use to show that they're dissatisfied is they would slow way down. Not stop working, because that would be to invite, you know, a, a punishment, a real punishment. But to slow way, way, way down. In other words, here's this vast treasure of tasks that you had to be done and three or four o'clock in the afternoon, and none of it's done. Well, the plantation owner, ladies and gentlemen, is not running a plantation. He's not in the business of running a plantation. He's in the business of making money. And if your labor force slows way, way, way down, you've got to figure out, you've got to get to the bottom of it. And so you go talk to your people. What is the problem? What is it that you guys are upset about? You have to talk to them. And usually they'll explain it very quickly. Strong note. One of the things that the slaves overwhelmingly complained about is having a white slave driver. They did not like that. Strong, strong note here. The slaves did not like having a white slave driver. They didn't like it. I'm sure they didn't want to have a slave driver at all, but everybody had to have a local boss. But they didn't like the white guys doing it. And you see this in all the newspapers. There'll be white guys that'll be in there advertising and say, listen, I'm out of work, I'm out of work, I'm out of work, and I'm a good slave driver and I know what I'm doing. But if they're white, they can't get a job. Continue on the strong notes. 
the law in many of these southern states said that you can't have a black slave driver. You can't do that. Now, to be clear, about 10 or 15 percent of the African population in the South were actually free. They bought their, they'd been emancipated. They'd bought their freedom somewhere along the line. They were free. And so they could hire out as slave drivers. And as it turns out, they're in much demand because the slaves will work for a black slave driver. They will. Or a slave driver of mixed heritage, which in the South, that means you're black. So in many of these southern states, there were laws against that. Strong note now, this is counterintuitive. The states would put on these laws saying you can't have a black slave driver, you can't have a black slave driver, you can't have a black slave driver. So what were people doing? What were these plantation owners doing that a black slave driver? And so they put these laws on the book saying, listen, you can't do that. And the reason was the legislation was always afraid of a slave uprising. More about that later. But the plantation owners don't care about a slave uprising. They want the work done. So you see again and again and again black slave drivers. And again, nobody wants to talk about that. That hardly ever shows up in the historical records. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. It never shows up in the textbooks. Nobody ever talks about that in the textbook. But it does show up in the historical record a lot. And it's, it's just counterintuitive. But again, the slave owner is trying to get those guys to do their job. And if they say, we don't want a white slave driver, okay, well, you fire the guy that you do have, the white slave driver, and you go get a one of mixed heritage, which in the South is considered black. And then they'll work. The point of this is that the slave owner is listening to the slaves. Again, you get this again and again and again. When we talk about slaves, you have to think about their education. You have to think about that. In other words, they know the fields better than anybody. So at the end of the season, when you're planning to do whatever it is you need to do to plant for the next year, you're going to go talk to your people. You're going to say, okay, we need to do crop rotation. So we're going to put cotton over there and we'll put corn over there and we'll put wheat over there and we'll put pumpkins over there or whatever it is you're going to do. And you got to go talk to your people. And if they say, listen, there's a, you know, a tobacco blight over in that field, well, then you say, okay, we've got to burn out that field and let it go fallow and put the tobacco all the way over on the other side of the plantation. And over there, okay, the ground flooded last year from the flood, and it's still too wet for wheat. Wheat does not like to have its roots wet, but corn does. So you'll put corn in there and not wheat. And then you'll say, okay, well, we've got bull weevils over in this field over here, so we need to burn that out and keep the cotton out of it for a while. And so you're talking to your slate to find out the condition of the fields so you know what to do next. The slaves are highly, highly educated in that sense. Continue on with this thought. Now, I'm on this one up there that says the slaves are the most valuable asset after the lands itself. Let's talk about education a little bit. Now, I've mentioned this before. Let me mention it again right now. There was law after law after law on the books in the South telling everybody not to teach the slaves to read. Now, we've talked about this. This should jog your memory a little bit. That should ring a bell. Don't teach the slaves to read. Again, the legislature is thinking, okay, they'll make plans, written plans, to do a slave overthrow and a slave rising, which we'll talk about that later, but it never happened. But they're very, very paranoid about that thing, that sort of thing. So they tell everybody, don't teach the slaves to read. But they had to repeat that law again and again and again and again. Well, why did they do that? Because the slave owners were teaching the slaves to read. You get that a lot. Surprisingly, number of a large number of slaves learn how to read. And what's the reason why? You all know the answer. If you've been paying attention to class at all, you already know the answer. you got to read that Bible. The South was going through the Second Great Awakening at the time. If the Bible Belt, it still is. And the way you save those souls is you got to you got to teach those slaves to read. They're responsible for their own souls. That's like a fundamental in Protestantism. And so, the slave owner's wife, the daughters, they would say, "Listen, you got to, you got to. I'm going to teach them how to read." Furthermore, and I've talked about this, reading or literacy is a transmutable skill. If you can read the Bible, you can read anything else. So for trusted slaves, you give them a set of instructions to send them off to town or over to the market or down to the docks with written instructions, and they'll follow those instructions. 
That's exactly what's going on here. So when you think of the slaves as that sort of an asset to the farm, and I have it up there, and I use caps, slaves are the most valuable asset after the land itself. Now let's continue on. Let me give you a good example of that. What if one year you had a downturn? You had an economic, you had a downturn because of the, the, the weather. Farmers are always worried about the weather. Again, I, I was raised in a farm community, and they were always worried about the weather. So everything's up and growing, and everything's doing great, and then a big giant storm comes along, and you have a hailstorm, and it knocks down the corn, it knocks down the wheat, it knocks down everything. You might be able to salvage some, but what can you always do? The farmer there owns the land, and he could go to the bank and say, listen, let me get, he could go to the bank and say, listen, I own the land. And so give me a loan to tide me over to the next year. We have this giant hailstorm, and I'm now my plants are all damaged up. Give me a loan until I can get through the next year. And what will the banker say? Yes, of course, I will do that. If there's wheat blight or tobacco blight, if you get corn borers or boll weevils or some other kind of insect that wrecks up your plants, that wrecks up your crops, you can always go to the bank and say, listen, I'll hawk the land in order to get some cash in order to tide over for another year. And the bank will always say yes, because you have a tremendous asset. You have the land. But if you have two or three years of bad crops or two or three years of bad weather, still the last thing that you get rid of, the last thing that you get rid of are your slaves. Because if you don't have that as a labor force, either A, you have to hire people to come in and do the land for pay, and you don't want to do that. Or you got to do it yourself, and you don't want to do that. But because on these big plantations you have diversity, one crop or another will always make. Even if you have a big giant hailstorm, something's going to make. Probably the, probably the cotton and maybe the tobacco. They're actually very resilient plants. But something will make. And you're going to be okay. You're at least going to be able to feed your people. If you've got a big giant field full of corn, as you see in the background, and all sorts of other plants which is the picture in the lower right, you have what they call a truck garden. And this is going to be your potatoes and carrots and all the cabbage and lettuce and all that other stuff that goes into a garden. Plus, you're always going to have hogs. You're also going to have a bunch of cows because part of the land is going to be turned into pasture no matter what. And so you've got this big giant farm with all of these other assets. You're always going to be able to feed your people. You're going to be able to get that far at least. And that will tide you over for a year, maybe even two. While for cash, you can off the land. And somewhere along the line, you're going to get a couple of good crops in. And then you'll be solvent again. But if you get rid of your labor force, then you're in trouble. You might as well sell out the land and go someplace else. So your most valuable asset are the slaves. And is that someone, think now, this is what I'm driving at, and this is the, South, this is the case that the South kept making. Are these people then that you're going to maltreat all day, every day? Furthermore, you knew these people their whole lives long. Again, this is a thing that like never, never turns up. And we'll talk, we'll talk about this again later on in some other uh, subsequent uh, posters, uh, uh, subsequent slides. These are individuals that you've known your whole life. You've known them forever and ever and ever. And that's not somebody that you're going to treat violently you're not going to, you have a relationship with these people. It may be distant. It may not be, you know, this kind of first name basis business, but you've known these people their entire lives long. You see them every day, year in and year out. And no society that's ever existed in humanity is going to be based on identifying 20 or 30 people. And then you by yourself, you beat them all day, every day. Humans just don't function like that. So there's more going on to the slavery business than meets the eye. Now, again, take a look at your notes. Hopefully you're writing good notes. Is that an easy case to make to the North? If somebody came at you and said slavery is evil, that's inarguable because everybody knew slavery was evil. Everybody knew it. It's in the Bible. Everybody knew slavery was bad. But as a Southerner, how do you actually respond to that? How do you justify that? We have to come up with this huge economic argument or this sociological argument. 
You know, I've known them my whole life. I wouldn't treat them badly. They're my labor force. I wouldn't treat them badly. They're valuable. I'm not going to treat them badly. But of course, what's the North? What's always going to be their case? Slavery is evil. So consider the North case. Strong note here. The North case is really based on Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher, B E E C H E R. Harriet Beecher Stowe. In 1854, she wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. I have it there in parentheses. And in Uncle Tom's Cabin, so she lays out the North case. Now, it's a little bit anachronistic. In other words, it's toward the end of the slavery era, which will uh, be part of the Civil War in 1860. And so here she's writing this book in 1854. So let's talk very briefly about Harriet Beecher Stowe. Now, she came from a family of people who were like highly, highly religiously motivated. She came from a family of preachers in the North. Highly Christian, highly motivated Christians, a uh, really strong family of, of preachers, basically, on both the Beecher side and the Stowe side. So, as it turns out, they would go uh, throughout the land, traveling and preaching and traveling and preaching. And she went through the South. And so she saw slavery up front. She's from the North. I think Pennsylvania. Don't hold me to that. But she's from the North. So she traveled through the South and she saw the slavery and she hated it. And she kept saying, I hate slavery, I hate slavery, I hate slavery. And all these Southerners say, yeah, well, okay, yeah, well, just preach the word of God and get out of here. So eventually she goes back up to the north and she wrote this book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Strong note now, Uncle Tom's Cabin is propaganda. That's all there is to it. It is agenda driven. It's highly abolitionist. But it lays out the North case. Uh, you get one little uh, vignette, one little story after another, after another, after another, within Uncle Tom's Cabin about how terrible slavery is, how the slaves are beaten, how they're always trying to escape. In one of the scenes, the slave driver, uh, Simon Legree is his name, and he's chasing after a runaway slave girl, uh, little Fanny. And Fanny's got her uh, uh, little, uh, little sister with her, and she's trying to run away and trying to run away. And here's Simon Legree, and he's chasing after her, and he's got the dogs after her. And if little Fanny and their little sister, if they could just get across the river, again, it's a religious, it's a biblical reference, get across the river, she will be in the land of milk and honey, she'll be in the land of freedom. Presumably the Ohio River. Well, so she's traveling across the frozen ground and terrible things are happening and she has to go across this icy creek or whatever it is. And Simon agrees like right after and he says, well, rather than let this little girl off into the land of freedom, I'll break the ice and have her go into it and drown with her little sister. And so you're making the slave driver to be an evil, evil man. And here's this little girl, and all she wants to do is be free with her little sister. And she's trying to escape to this, to the north, presumably. And so, in the north, this was the version of what slavery was like, that it's evil and it's hateful, and it's all full of all these beatings, and there's violence all day, every day, towards every slave. The North version of what slavery was like was that, you know, you lock up your slaves at night, throw them a piece of rotten meat, and lock them up in a, in a shack. And in the morning, you unlock the shack and throw them another piece of rotten meat, and then beat them and tell them to get out in the field. And you beat them all day in the field. And then at night, you put them back in their little shack and throw them a piece of rotten meat, and then you tell them, like, go to sleep because you're going to get up in the morning and do it again. And so when Uncle Tom's Cabin came out, when it was published, the South was absolutely outraged. They said, it's not like that at all. But the point here, ladies and gentlemen, is that's what the North thought. Now, again, I can't overemphasize this. Please make a strong note of this. There are hardly any black people at all in the North. Most Northerners in the time frame we're talking about, that antebellum period, 1800 to 1860, had never seen a black person. They had no firsthand knowledge of what slavery is like. You cannot look at slavery through the filter of our existence today in the 21st century. You have to look at it as they saw it then. And most Northerners had never seen a slave. They'd never seen a slave. Most of them had never seen a black person at all, ever. And so when Harriet Beecher Stowe's book came out, millions of copies were sold. Everybody was reading it, and everybody was, like, talking about it. Well, in the North, that's what they thought slavery was really like. It is propaganda, and it worked perfectly perfectly. 
Please write that down. Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin is propaganda. It's abolitionist propaganda, and God bless her, it worked. Later on, Lincoln met her. And here's Lincoln, what, six foot four, and Harriet Beecher Stowe's like five foot zero. And he looked at her and shook her hand and said, you're the little lady that started this great big giant war. And she was. Because she's promoting this very, very negative view of what slavery was all about. So that is the Norse side of what slavery was like. It's based on the Harriet Beecher Stowe version. But what would the South say about that? No, it's not like that at all. But then they can't really explain it. It's hard to explain how you can incentivize these people to do the work and how valuable they all actually are. It's extremely difficult to explain that. Last but not least, well, not last but not least, but let's take a look at that last bullet point at least. Now, in our American mythology, we always want to compare the life of the slave to the life of the plantation owner. That you want to compare the life of these slaves to the rich, wealthy, and elite. These slaves who have virtually nothing, we'll talk more about that in a minute, to the rich, wealthy, elite. Well, that's not really, that's not a good comparison. In other words, as you're listening to me talking about this, I want you guys to be thinking about your lifestyle. And do you compare your lifestyle to Warren Buffett or Jamie Dimon or Bill Gates or somebody that's really, really, really super wealthy? Do you compare your lifestyle to their lifestyle and say, listen, I want to be like them. I, I don't know why I'm not living in a gigantic mansion. No, we compare ourselves with each other. That's how you get through your life. What are other people looking like and how do they dress and how do they conduct themselves in the grocery store? What about the people that you see on a day-to-day -day basis? The guys and the young lady, men and women that you went to school with. You compare yourself to their lifestyles. You don't compare yourself to the ultra-wealthy. You just don't. Well, let's project that concept backwards. Instead of considering the comparison between the life of the slave and the life of the plantation owner, let's consider the life of the slave versus a poor white. Now, I have some numbers that uh, are, are going to bear some examination later on, but let's do that comparison. Take a look at a poor white. They've got a small patch of land, and they're subsistence farmers. Subsistence farmers. That is to say, they're only farming just enough to stay alive. They can't do much more. They don't have a slave. They're working for themselves. So perhaps they got a little bit of cotton, maybe a little bit of tobacco on their farm for cash. But then the rest of it is just food to eat. Wheat and corn and a, a big giant truck garden, as you see down there in the, uh, in the lower right. Well, that farmer, he's living on the very edge of existence. If a hailstorm went through and damaged up the crops on the big plantation, well, it wiped him out. The big plantation would be able to survive, but the small farmer's wiped out. And then he can go to the bank and say, listen, I've got a little bit of land. Give me a little bit of money, and I'll hawk the land. And the bank will say, maybe, but if you have two bad years in a row, then you're wiped out. And the only thing you can do then as a poor white is pack up and move out. Just abandon everything, abandon the house, abandon all your stuff, abandon all your hard work, and move west. Move to the northeast. Move someplace else. But the plantation has assets, and they can, their slaves are going to survive, and they're going to have plenty of food to eat because they have crop diversity. They have corn. They have wheat. They have that in plenty. They have a whole bunch of hog. They have cattle. Because you've got this big, giant farm, you can, like, make it work. Furthermore, okay, you can say, well, the slaves were living in really, really harsh conditions. And that's true. Slave uh, quarters were like really, really bad. There are some examples still surviving to this very day. Not many. But you can see how the slaves were like living in basically a dirt shack with barely a roof on it and maybe a chimney where you can like do some cooking. And there's plenty of images of that, either in photographs or uh, William Aiken Walker. He painted that stuff, too. But when you compare that to a poor white, then the comparison becomes nearly equal. Because the poor white, he had to live in a dirt shack, a log cabin. He had to live in a small farm. He doesn't have much. He's right there with all of his animals. If he put a lot of effort into the farm, then he put a whole lot of effort into the barn. Because his animals are extremely valuable. His equipment's really, really valuable. The wagon and the plow and all that other stuff. 
So he's willing to live in a shack with his wife and two or three kids, but all the equipment and all the farm animals, they got to have some nice place to stay. So when you compare the lifestyles of the slave versus poor whites, we have a lot more of a, a comparison there. Yes? Under any circumstance, the slave can see how, if they'll put forth some effort, then their lives will be at least stable and more or less comfortable. But with the poor white, they're living on the very edge of existence all of the time. And so their situation was really, really quite miserable. Hard, back-breaking work, the same work that the slaves would have to do. It's just that they own their labor. They can control their labor. And hopefully they're gaining something out of it. In other words, they're going to get their farm. They're going to own it. And last but not least, they are. They've got that one asset that the slaves were always dreaming of. And that's freedom. They've got their freedom. And with that in mind, let's talk about the last one, slave rebellions. Strong note here. If slavery is as bad as Harriet Beecher Stowe would believe, then we would expect a lot of rebellions. No one, no one, no society lives under the threat of violence for very long. If they live under the threat of actual violence all day, every day, and they're maltreated all the time, they'll rebel. That's what will happen. A famous philosopher once said that we're, even today, we are three square meals away from rebellion. That's just the way it works out. People do not like to be abused, and they don't like a situation to deteriorate really, really badly. So people will always resort to violence if things are bad. The slaves know less. Strong note. The worst slave uprising in American history is Nat Turner's Rebellion in the 1830s. For our for the purpose of our class, 1835. That's close enough for me. Now let's talk about Nat Turner's Rebellion very briefly. Nat Turner was a slave in Virginia. But it's the time of the Second Great Awakening. And Nat Turner felt the calling. Well, his master said, okay, preach the word of God. Now, this sounds great, but to put it bluntly, a poor understanding of the actual Christian message can actually be kind of dangerous. Christianity is an interpretive religion. And so Nat Turner, who felt the, the, the presence of the Lord, he, he had the calling, uh, he goes out there and preaches the message. So it came to pass that there was a partial lunar eclipse. In other words, um, the moon was on one side, the earth was in the middle and the sun was on the other side. So the shadow of the earth eclipsed the moon. And Nat Turner saw that as a sign from God that he should murder his master and their family and lead a slave uprising and start this slave rebellion. Now, it's unfortunate, but that's what happened. He got a bunch of other slaves to go along with him. He had this religious fervor going along, and he did murder his master and his wife and their kids, several other people. But immediately, the rest of the rebellion fell apart. In other words, some of the other slaves, like they, they ran off, they did. More about them in a second. And Nat Turner, he's trying to like get this rebellion going, but nobody else joined him. Now, the rest of the community there in Virginia, they found out about all this, and they got way, way up in arms. This drives a lot of paranoia about the slaves, a lot. This has consequences. Again, this is when you start getting law after law after law in the books, saying don't teach the slaves to read, keeping on the slaves all the time. This drove a lot of paranoia. But here's the deal, and this is what I want you guys to write down. Slavery in America began in our colonial era, 1650s or so, when the laws changed. We've talked about that. So from 1650 to 1860, when the Civil War begins, in that entire period, well over 200 years, the worst slave uprising when Nat Turner's Rebellion and less than 30 people were involved, maybe 32, 35, depending on how you count them. The records at the time were a little bit vague. Let's go 35. 35 people are involved. That's the worst slave uprising in American history. Nearly 200 years of slavery, and that's the worst one. So if Harriet Beecher Stowe had gotten it right, there'd be rebellion after rebellion after rebellion after rebellion. And it just strongly suggests that there's a different dynamic going on. I'm not suggesting under any circumstances that people wanted to be slaves. Nobody wanted that. The slaves don't want to be slaves. They want their freedom.
Slavery is pernicious. It's evil. But there had to be a different there had to be a different relationship going on there to keep the slaves from perpetually rebelling. The white people had to be doing something positive towards these slaves to keep them from rebelling. There had to be a relationship there. Now, there was another slave rebellion. I was in New York. It was in the 1760s. And it turns out that it was more on the nature of a strike. Uh, nobody was really killed in this. Nobody was really harmed. Everybody talks about this. Uh, the Stono Rebellion, that was a whole different thing. Uh, it was a revolt, but it was like way up in the north. And like nobody was really even hurt. But this uh, revolt that went on in New York, as it turns out, in the 1760s, it was cured very rapidly and very quickly by none other than William Franklin, who was Ben Franklin's son, who was then the governor of New York. And he simply picked up the pen and as the governor of the colony of New York, emancipated the few slaves that were in New York. And immediately the strike went away. He just like picked up the pen and said, okay, you're all free. And that solved it. But that's the second worst slave revolt in American history. Again, it was in the North, and there were only a few individuals involved, and it resulted in, so there were so few individuals involved that it resulted in their freedom. The worst slave uprising in American history is Nat Turner's Revolt. 1830s, less than 35 people involved. Let me finish this up, though. The result of Nat Turner's Rebellion was horrible. The white population dramatically overreacted, and about 100 were lynched. About 100 were lynched, and it's terrible, terrible, terrible. In other words, white people would see black people like walking along the road, especially at or near dark, and they would say, well, you're part of this revolt, and we're going to lynch you, we're going to hang you up, and they did. Nat Turner was eventually turned in. He was hiding in a swamp, and some of the other slaves found out about it, and they went to their white master and said, listen, we know where Nat Turner is at. So they went there, talked to this guy, talked him out of the swamp, and they lynched him too. They hanged him up. And so the outcome is really, really bad in that the white population is very, very nervous about the black population, very nervous about them all the time. But it simply means that, in effect, the white population, they've got to like treat their slaves halfway decent, or they may be in for a revolt. And the numbers, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, the numbers kind of bear that out. There has to be a relationship there that is not based on perpetual beatings all day, every day for every slave. Did violence take place? Yes, it did. That is an absolute fact. And it's horrible. But did the violence, was it exposed to all slaves all day, every day? Well, the answer is no, that's not what happened. There has to be a different relationship going on there. So that's kind of the start of what we're talking about here. But let's continue on with this. What we're going to talk about next, um, we're going to take a look at um, some sale posters. And we're going to take a look at some other uh, really unsavory uh, information. But then we're going to try and like get a little bit of uh, information out of that. So let's move on and take a look at um, some, of the, some of the documents. On this slide, I want to consider some of the documents that are involved. And let's, let's use this as a teaching tool. Now, the documents themselves that you can see here on the left, these are horrible, horrible documents. Now, one is a for sale poster. That's what's really going on here, the sale of valuable slaves on account of departure. This guy's heading off to Europe or wherever it is that he's going. And the idea of human beings being put on sale is reprehensible. It's horrible. Got it. The other document, that kind of brown colored one, $2,500 reward for people who ran away. God bless them. I hope they made it. But there's basically a reward for their return as though they were like, you know, well, their, their property, as though they were criminals or something. But let's kind of delve into this a little bit. Now, I do want to use a little bit of image analysis first, and those are the two pictures that you see on the right. So, that northern, that, the northern, that, that picture on the top, the upper right, you can see here that this is the south point of view. And this is an illustration from the time, and it's silly. Uh, they have lovely shacks in the background. They're out there by the fields. Everybody's well-dressed, bright colors. Uh, they've got a jug band going with a banjo and a jug, and they've got, you know, some, some drink going around, and everybody's singing and dancing. It's really this utopia. That's a lie. 
Working as a slave, working anywhere back in those days, is extremely difficult, back-breaking work. There's no time off on a farm. You don't get that. You might get a little bit of a Saturday afternoon and maybe a Sunday off, but you're not going to get much time off. Farming is hard, back-breaking work that just has to go on and on and on. Cows need to be milked every day. They don't take a day off. Chickens, they're laying eggs. They get the, you don't take a day off for that. Things have to go on all the time. Yes, you have chores that you have to do. So that is nonsense. On the bottom, the lower right, uh, again, this is an illustration from the time. And you have this unfortunate individual stripped naked, staked down on the ground. You're making the other slaves watch, and another slave still is like beating this guy. And everybody's like, it's like a sporting event or something. And it's like really, really spectacularly horrible. And so you're using this as a tool to intimidate everybody else, a visual, you know, intimidation, factor of intimidation. Well, did that sort of thing go on? Well, yes, it did. As it turns out, there was violence exhibited toward the slaves. That's a fact, an absolute fact. But were all slaves all day, every day, beaten and violently abused? Well, no, that's not consistent with logic. It just isn't. So what I'm driving at with these two illustrations is that the truth is somewhere in between. That's, that's the basic uh, element of the South case. The truth is somewhere in between. Is that some utopia? No, it is not. Is it some violent beating all day, every day for every slave? No, it is not. The truth is somewhere in the middle. Well, with that, let's go over here and take a look at these two documents. Now, as you're watching this and listening to what I'm saying, I want you guys to be reading what it says. And we're going to try and get some lessons out of this because a lot of things that are going on here happens. And uh, in other words, these are not the only posters that show what they show. I could have gotten hundreds and hundreds of different posters that show the same thing. Now, here we are on the far left, valuable slaves on account of departure. And what I want you guys to do is I go through this very briefly. So I want you to take a look at the skill sets. So the first one is uh, Sarah. Now, that next phrase, uh, well, I'll talk about that more in a moment, but it's very, very racist, so I'm not going to use that phrase. But she's age 45, a good cook, and accustomed to housework, and here are all of her skill sets. Now, again, I cannot overemphasize this. Those are extremely valuable skill sets. If you can cook and clean, think of just cooking. Let's just take a simple task, you know. I woke up this morning and I decided, listen, I want some stew for dinner tonight. Okay, well, you've got to get your cook to, like, do that. She's got to go down and get to get, get some sort of meat, whether it's, like, beef or lamb or chicken or whatever the stew's going to be. Then she's got to go over to the green grocers or out to the garden, and she's got to pick all the stuff. Then she's got to clean it all. Then she's got to get a fire going. Then she's got to get some water out of the well. Then she's got to start stewing up all the stuff and spice it all up, and she's got to keep the fire going. While she's doing all sorts of other tasks, you're going to want some bread. So she's got to make bread from scratch. I don't know how many of you guys listening to me now have ever made bread from scratch. I don't mean with one of those bread machines where you throw it all in and hit a switch. I mean, you get a bowl, you get the flour, you get the yeast going, you knead it all down, you let it rise, you knock it all down again, and you put it in the oven. Think of that simple task. How do you tell, in other words, if the oven is too hot? Back in those days, they call it a quick oven. If it's too hot, your bread will burn on the outside and be raw on the inside. Nope, that's no good. If the oven is not hot enough, if it's not quick enough, if it's too slow, then your bread will never cook up. So in an age before any kind of thermostat on an oven, how do you tell the temperature of the, of the oven? Well, you've got to use your hand. The closer you can get your hand to the oven, the longer that you can keep it there, then the hotter it is. But then you have to sustain that temperature at a steady state for a long, long time. And that's an extremely valuable skill set. So when we talk about people that are doing just the ordinary task that you and I would take for granted today, that's an extremely valuable task back in those days. Uh, go down to the next one. Dennis, uh, her son... 24, a first-rate cook and a steward, having done that uh, on the packet for a long, long time. Uh, he is a, a sober, temperate person, a first-rate subject. So again, here's a guy that's got a whole lot of skill sets that are very, very valuable. 
Chloe, age 36, without exception, one of the most competent servants in the country. And she does washing and cleaning, you know, washing clothes. Let's take a second to wash some clothes. Again, you got to build a fire. Well, in an age before there's any matches, think about having to build a fire. Then you get a towed bunch of water from the well. Well, for those of you guys who don't know, water weighs, I think, like 21 gallons, like 11 pounds to the gallon, something like that. And so you got to, like, get about, I don't know, 15 or 20 gallons of water out of the well. Well, that's several hundred pounds in weight. Then pour it into a great big giant witch's cauldron. Every household had one of those. If you ever go to an antique store, especially a larger one, they've got a whole bunch of those antique kettles everywhere. They're all over the place because every household had to have one. So you pour the water in there. You get a fire going. Then you've got to have some soap. Now, you can buy soap back in those days, but most people made it. So you get uh, animal droppings, usually hog droppings, because you need the glycerin and you need the acid in there to do uh, the cleaning. Then you use ash and you use a couple of other ingredients, and you have soap. So you throw all the clothes in. you got the water hot, and you have to stir it all around. Well, those of you who are of the uh, female persuasion answer this question for me and everybody else at least think about it how does an open fire and a long skirt how well does that mix that does not mix well at all and so burns and scalding is like one of the most common household dangers all the way up until well in the 20th century people are getting burned all the time getting caught on fire all the time you get the clothes finally washed and then you got to wring them all out again you got to have a lot of upper body strength for that then you got to hang them up They've got to iron it. Everything had to be ironed. Wash and wear clothing, that's a late 20th century thing. Everything had to be ironed. So you're back to having another fire. And you take an iron, you put it on the fire. Usually you got four or five or six irons. If you go antiquing, again, there's always a whole bunch of irons. You put the iron on the fire, and then you pick it up, and you do a little bit of ironing until the iron cools down. Then you put the iron back on the fire, and you get another iron off, and you like keep ironing. It's hot, back-breaking work, but everything had to be done that way. So simply washing clothes, which today is a task that anybody can do. Throw your stuff in there, a little bit of soap, mash a button, you're off to the next adventure. Back in those days, doing clothes, washing, and ironing is an extremely valuable skill set. Go down to uh, Fanny. Uh, her daughter, age 16, speaks French and English. And she does all this hairdressing, okay? Evidently, it says on there, she's a pupil of Guillaume. I have no idea who Guillaume is, but she was sent to school to be a hairdresser. Again, a simple task today. But back in those days, an extremely valuable task. She went to school to do that. Um, women talked about this all the time, and men would make fun of it. That they'd be putting on a bonnet to go out, and yet they'd have their hair done under the bonnet. And men would say, what do you have your hair done under the bonnet for? We got to have that... And women would say, listen, you don't even understand. It has to be done. If you take a look at photographs, especially of middle class or, or high, women higher up the food chain, they had their hair done all the time. Tight little pin curls. Everything's like all washed and, and, and really uh, done up in expensive, extravagant styles. Braided. It's amazing. Dandridge, she's a first-rate dining room servant, a painter, and a carpenter. Okay, well, those, again, are very valuable skill sets. If you need, you know, any kind of carpentry done, you don't go down and get that done from the carpenter unless you have to. But if you've got a guy that can actually do some rough carpentry, okay, awesome. Have him do it. You know, build a, a chair or a bench, you know, some bookshelves, something like that. Just rough carpentry, sure. Got to patch the roof, send Dandridge up there. He can do it. Again, a very, very valuable skill set. Uh, Nancy, his wife, aged about 24, a confidential house servant, a seamstress, and a mantua maker. A mantua maker. This is a phrase that's really gone out of the English language. But imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if you went to your high school prom, ladies, that dress that you spent so much money on, hundreds of dollars, made out of high-end materials, satin or silk, that was the equivalent of a mantua. It's a very, very high-end dress made out of extremely expensive material. This isn't calico. It's satin or silk. So imagine then you're going to turn over, you're going to go down and get a bunch of silk, you know, some rich colors, and you're going to turn it over to a seamstress, and she's going to measure you all out, 
and then make a dress for you. A very, very high-end dress. Well, that makes Nancy an extremely valuable individual. She's a seamstress. She's a tailor and a mantua maker, an extremely good one at that. To be clear, this is long before the sewing machine had been invented. So when this dress was made, it was absolutely, from, from, all, from the hem to the collar, was done in hand stitching. And that's extremely valuable skill set. And you go on down through there, Mary Ann speaks French and English. Uh, Fanny, uh, a first-rate cook and, and washer. Emma speaks French and English. Frank speaks French and English. I challenge many of my students, okay, think. How well are you, if you were like, think of you being in a classroom, which is the way I'm approaching this question, and I ask the entire class, how many guys are actually comfortable with being bilingual? In other words, whatever your second language is, you like know it back and forth. And sometimes I'll get a few students stick a hand up. But then I challenge them all. I said, most of you have had Spanish for two or three years in a row. And you can't get past cerveza por favor. Or maybe you'll get to, to dos cerveza por favor. You'll get that far. Okay. Well, but here we have what out of um, 10 different individuals. One, two, three, four, five of them are speaking French and English. Come on now. These are valuable individuals. When we talk about their education, please understand that it's a lot more than what you think. Washing and cleaning, that's education. Hairdressing, that's education. Carpentry, they're educated. These people are extremely valuable. Let's take a look at this reward thing. In other words, that's $2,500 in, what's the date on there? 1865, I think. That's a huge amount of money. These are extremely valuable individuals. And if you look through there, take a few minutes if you want, you can see that their skill sets are also on display here. They can do all sorts of really good things. And almost all of them are described as being well clothed. One of them, I think, plays the violin. Others are like, they're doing all sorts of like really, really good skill sets. And that makes them very, very valuable. Now, again, what does that indicate about the slaves? These are people that you've, you, you're not going to violently treat them all day, every day. Second, what does it say about the owners? The owners want them very, very badly. They value them a, a huge amount. Uh, this guy with this, I, uh, and I hope that all these people, what is it, George, Noah, uh, Hamp, I hope, and Bob, I hope they all got away. I hope they all made it to the north. I hope they all made it to the north. But this guy was willing to pay $2,500, which was a vast treasure of money back in those days, to get those individuals back. So when we talk about, are slaves living in a utopia? No, they're not. Are they being beaten all day, every day for every slave? That, that's absolutely not the case. Is violence or coercion, is that a possibility? Certainly. But the truth lies somewhere in between, ladies and gentlemen. And again, the North case was easy to make. Slavery is immoral, which is true. Slavery is evil. That's true. But what case did the South make? The South kept saying, listen, you don't understand what's going on down here. This is our workforce. These are people that we value. But what would the North always be able to say? Slavery is bad. So with that in mind, let's uh, continue on with our examination here. And let's take a look. I have a pie chart for you. So just uh, be prepared to draw this pie chart right into your notes. Just use your artistic capabilities and let's take a look at some numbers. Now I have here a pie chart. Let me set the pie chart up. You can see that uh, this is from the slave only population 1850. Now that should like be ringing a bell to you. 1850 is a census year. So what we have here are hard numbers. This isn't guesswork. It's hard numbers. So let's take a look at some hard numbers. The U.S. population in 1850, based on the census, was 23,191,876. That's what the census showed. That's a fact. The overall southern population, now we're talking about here the states that will later on secede. I'll have a map up in a little while. It's about 8.6 million in 1850. That's about what it was. It may have been just a little bit lower than that. It's kind of hard to figure it out exactly where the delineation's at. In other words, do you throw in Delaware and Maryland, which were slave states at the time? 
but about 8.6 billion. But of that population, almost, but not quite half, were slaves. Of the 8.6 million, 3.1 million were slaves. Think about that. Every other person that you ran into in the South was a slave. So just based on those numbers, half the population nearly are slaves. Now, is there any population on planet Earth ever in the beginning, since the beginning of human beings, where one half of the population absolutely enslaved the other half? That that's, has never happened. It happened in America. But again, it points to this idea that some other relationship had to be going on other than violence all day, every day. In other words, to oppress this population, half the population violently, it would take the unslaved, the white half of the population, all of their living hours to monitor these people that they're violently oppressing. It just, it just doesn't happen like that. It just simply does not. So only the slave population is shown in the pie chart, which means that, strong note now, 75% of the southern population own no slaves. They didn't own slaves. So we're talking about the 3.1 million slaves are owned by 347,525 families. That's what the pie chart shows. Half of the southern population was only owned by about 20% of the white population. So with that in mind, 347,525 families are owning about 3.1 million people in 1850. Now let's take a look at the pie chart. Now, the first thing I want you guys to do is imagine, if you will, our society as a pyramid, not a pie, but a pyramid. And please understand that when you think of it as a pyramid, you know that the people that at the very apex, the very top of the pyramid, are only 1% or 2% of that population. Then you have to go down quite a ways, and then the, the pyramid gets broader and broader as you go down to the bottom. Well, that's what's going on with this pie chart. Take a look at that tan part up there at the very top, 50 or more slaves. But that's only maybe 1% of the slave-owning population, which is only 25% of the white population in the South. So these really, really big plantations, it's exactly what you would anticipate. It's only a tiny fraction of the overall slave population are owned by that, that 1%. The big population, the big slave plantations are only a small percentage. Let's take a look at that kind of purple color and the green color. That's another, you know, quarter of the pie chart. Well, that's from 20 down to 10 slaves. And you would imagine going down in your par in your pyramid, okay, well, that's a, that's a larger group of the population. But it's still only a small part of the entire slave population. Then you get to that red area. Almost a quarter of our pie chart are five to nine slaves. So you take a look at the tan that purple color and the green color. That's 25% of the slave population owned by that group. Fine. Those are the big farms, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the big plantations. And that's where a lot of money is being made in the South. That's true. The Southern uh, economy, again, more about that in a little bit, it was basically an agricultural based economy. Exactly what Jefferson said was going to happen. We've talked about that. When you get down to five to nine, that's a very small farm. But more than likely, it's a small business in one of the towns. Mobile, Alabama, places in Virginia, in Richmond, Norfolk, Virginia, um, Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, Mobile, Alabama, New Orleans. That's where those slaves are at. They're in small businesses. They're aiding as slaves in... Uh, um, a, a, a carpentry shop, a woodcutting shop, or a blacksmith store, or a wagon store, someplace like that that's building stuff, small manufacturing, or they're in a dry goods store, they're in some other kind of store, or someplace like that, or a very, very small farm. Five to nine slave, that's not a very big farm at all. Imagine, if you will, the owners out there working besides the slaves on the farm. That's the only way you can make it produce. But I have on there, and I have it on there as a bullet point, closely examine the big blue area, that sky blue part. That's one to four slaves. 
Strong note here, super strong note. You're going to need this one later. Ladies and gentlemen, these are household servants. Now, I kind of alluded to this on the previous slide, and even the slide before that. Please understand, you guys, that living in a household back in those days was an extremely brutal, difficult business. Most streets were unpaved, and you had animals, horses, cattle, all sorts of other animals going up and down the streets all the time. So then, occasionally, it's going to come along and rain. And these animal, this animal manure is everywhere. Then you go walking down through them this dirt street and you come into the house. Well, you're tracking in mud that's contaminated with animal urine and animal feces. And nobody did house slippers back in those days. So you can imagine you're tracking this stuff into the house. Well, that means that your house has to be swept clean all the time. You're going to have carpets, but they're going to be in the form of a rug. And the rug has to be taken out and beaten all the time. You're going to come into your home and you're going to want some food. And food has to be cooked. You're going to want clean clothes and they have to be taken care of all the time. You're going to have kids and they need to be taken care of, washed and minded all the time. You're going to have little animals and this and that and the other around. So you can like feed off of that. You're going to have shopping that you need to do. And you're going to have to have somebody to do that. Please understand, ladies especially, if you don't have a slave doing that, you have to do that. And throughout the South, that's the way most of it was. Most of the women did their own work. But if you can get a household servant, what do you tell your husband? Get off your ass and go down there and buy me a slave girl because I want her to do all this hard backbreaking work. I want her to take some of the burden off of me. At least do the cleaning. Haul in the wood, get the fire going so we stay warm at night. Then haul out the ashes during the day. Haul in the water. Take care of all the back-breaking hard work that has to be done. Because if you don't get a slave girl to do it, you have to do it yourself. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, these are slaves that you are, they're called body servants. Please write that down. These are slaves that are called body servants. And these are individuals that you've known intimately your whole life long. And if you have trouble with that individual, please understand what the only recourse is. You can't really beat them because you have to live with them all the time. Now listen, you're going to go to sleep sometime or another. And if you're violently beating your slave all day, every day, a house servant, you know, well, you're going to wake up dead. That's just what's going to happen. Well, that only rarely, rarely, very extremely rarely ever happened in the South. Like never. You just never, you never hear about that in the historical record. So there had to be some kind of relationship between the house servant and the owners. There had to be some kind of relationship there. And it can't be all negative, to be clear. Ladies, if you just can't get along with that girl, can you beat her? Yes, you can, and people did. But if you can't get along with her, what is your real recourse? You tell your husband, okay, take her out there and sell her. Get rid of her. But immediately you have to tell your husband, but get me another one. I need a replacement. And so he brings back this other person that he's bought. Horrible, I know. But then the lady of the house has to try to get a relationship with her. Here's what you need to do. Here are your tasks. Here's where everything is at. You got to get her all trained up. And if that doesn't work out, what do you tell your husband? Go sell her and go and give me another one. And you have to go through that all over again. Well, that's extremely stressful, as you can imagine. Extremely stressful. So rather than sell your servant girl all the time, hoping for a better one, what do you actually do? You just exhibit some patience. You try to get a relationship going on there. And you kind of, you, you, you have to work out your problems. And while that does not really emerge in the historical record very much, it had to have happened. It had to be going on in the background. Now, again, you're going to need this later when we start talking about the Dred Scott case. That's exactly what was going on with Dred Scott and his wife, Harriet. They were household servants. Think of the guy, by the way, just really quickly. Let's say you're out on the farm and you've got two or three slaves out there working in the field. You're working in the field with them from time to time, but you've got to go to town. You've got to take care of business, which had to happen. So what do you tell your slave guy? Go out there, get the buckboard ready to go, get the wagon ready to go. Let's go. So he does that. Again, that's a valuable skill set. Catch up an animal, hook him to a wagon, and get ready to go into town. 
You get into town, what does the master do? He takes a list and goes from place to place to place around town, dropping off the list of the things that he wants done. Go to the dry goods store. These are the, the store. These are the things we want. Go to the clothing store. Get bolts of cloth. That's the things we want. Get all these things. In the meantime, your slave is watching the horse and the wagon. Because if you don't have somebody watching the horse and the wagon, they are quite capable of walking off. Somebody will steal it. Well, then the master comes back and he watches the horse and the wagon and drinks a nice cold beer or probably a lukewarm beer. And he watches the horse and the wagon while you send your slave guy out to all these different places to pick up the stuff and bring it back and put it in the wagon. And then you both get on the wagon and you've taken care of all your business. You go back out to the house. Then your slave guy has to unhitch the horse, get it into food, put the wagon back in the wagon uh, barn, and then unload all the stuff out of it and bring it into the house. So if you don't have a slave, then you have to do those things, which is not easy. So having a household servant, having a body servant is common. It's absolutely a common thing. Everybody had to have that. And that can't be somebody that you're going to violently maltreat all day, every day. That's just not the way human beings work. It just isn't. Well, with that in mind, and I'm trying to like hurry up a little bit, uh, we need to head, we need to like talk a little bit about the macro. So let's move on and take a look at some maps. Here we need to be taking a look at the macro. And as you can see, take a look at the maps at the upper, what would be upper left. In 1790, again, uh, the uh, American War of Independence ended in 1783. And you can see that all the slaves are concentrated in and along the coastline. They have not moved inland yet. And this is dealing with all of the, uh, the, the, the triangular trade. That's where all the slaves were at. But don't be fooled. We simply have not moved inland yet. 1720s, uh, cotton has come along. We've got the cotton gin going. We've moved inland. Uh, we're, we're dealing with Indian removal, and we will talk about that as we go down through here. But as you can see, all the slaves are starting to move inland. Also note that the slaves that were up there in New York, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, they're basically all gone. And all the slaves are more and more concentrated in the south. There's still a lot of them in some of the cities, especially New Orleans. You can see that and in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia. And you can also make that out, those really dark patches over there on the East Coast. And so there's still a lot of uh, slavery along the East Coast, and especially in and around New Orleans. But then by 1860, which is that, that kind of um, darker map there in the middle of the slide, you see that slavery is really, really, really super widespread. It's moved way down into Texas. It's up into Missouri. Uh, but there's hardly any at all in the Northeast and the upper Midwest, like none. On the other hand, you can see the big giant swaths of area that are like really, really black. Well, those are one dot uh, equals 200 slaves. And so you can see that there are a lot of areas out there that are just absolutely, the slaves are concentrated, heavily, heavily concentrated in those areas, especially Virginia, North and South Carolina, Georgia, and then through that cotton belt, that dark kind of path that goes through Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And that's where cotton is the king. Okay, so we have a, a tremendous slave population in the South by 1860, half the population. There's about five, there's nine million people in the South in 1860. The census shows there's about nine million people in the South. And of those, four million are slaves. But then they're heavily, heavily concentrated. However, the North is absolutely, you can see that in that, uh, where in 1860, there's like no slaves in the North. And the South are becoming more and more anxious about this. They're having a lot of anxiety about it. Uh, Harry Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, had come out by that time, 1854. It's widespread. The North is like really becoming antagonistic towards slavery as an institution. But more importantly, let's take a look at the economy of it all. And that's on the right side of the slide. You have it broken down, and I try to get, uh, try to pick some. Um, uh, 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 Images that would really help you out with this. Very basic. So the population in the south is half of what it is in the north. In the north, what the population is like uh, 20 million in the north, and there's only like 9 million in the south. That's it in 1860. 
So the, the southern population is a lot smaller, of which a lot of those are slaves. Farm acreage, okay, as it turns out in the south, there's a little bit more. They had an agriculture-based economy. Basically, it's still cotton, sugar, and tobacco. Cotton is king, but tobacco and sugar are like really, really important cash crops. In the north, their cash crops are really corn and wheat, oats and barley, so grain crops. Railroad, railway mileage, the south has very little, and as you'll see in a later slide, especially in the Civil War, all the railroads go straight to the north and come from the north straight back to the south. In other words, what the south is doing is taking all of their cash crops, tobacco and cotton in particular, and sending it to the north. And then they're bringing back manufactured goods from the north. But in the north, they have a very, very diverse economy. So they have a whole lot more railroad tracks, a lot more railroad tracks. Because they're doing all this manufacturing. They've got to get that taconite, that is to say iron that's in the ground, they've got to get it out. They've got to get coal out of the ground. They've got to move it to different places to get smelted into steel and iron. Then all that stuff has to be sent usually to New York City. It's like be turned into usable products. And then that all has to be shipped all over the United States and all over the rest of the world. The North is doing all this manufacturing, which is the very next issue there. Manufacturing establishment in the South, like very, very few. I think by 1861, statistic has it that the value of all the manufactured goods in the South is one-tenth of that in New York City alone. So New York, New York is really the manufacturing center of the North, but manufacturing is huge in the North. That's their entire economy is based upon that. And so they have vast treasure more wealth in the North. Workers in manufacturing in the South, almost none. In the north, that's what everybody does. The value of manufacturing, again, is that uh, in the south, like the value of manufacturing is like virtually nil compared to what's going on in the north. Capital stocks and bank, very little in the south. The money is all tied up in the land. But in the north, they have a cash-based, uh, a manufacturing-based economy. And so they have a vast treasure of wealth that's being generated day in and day out. So again, the, the south knows that they're at a disadvantage. They know that. And they know that the North is, by 1860s, is becoming really antagonistic towards slavery as a labor force. Now, as we'll see, the Northern labor force is being badly maltreated, and we'll talk about that later. But they are not slaves. And the North keeps saying, listen, the slavery business is really, really bad. And so the South, they become much, much more, they have this, this, this anxiety about it. And they're eaten up about it. The South cannot imagine a lifestyle without slaves. They just can't picture it. And so, again, that's that last bullet point that's down there. You start getting, especially beginning in kind of in the mid-1840s, you get all this rhetoric that's out there. Uh, this rhetoric that's like really anti-North. Uh, this rhetoric that starts uh, uh, picturing African Americans in a way that's so stereotypical and so negative that they're lazy or they're unknowledgeable or they're, they're less somehow of a human being. That had never been part of the rhetoric up until the 1840s. No one had said that. Madison, Washington, Jefferson, none of the same thinking people in America in the 1700s had ever said anything like that. But now you start getting this uh, rhetoric that Africans are lesser as human beings. And it's because the South is becoming really, really defensive about it, that they have to be watched, they have to be minded, that they're like childlike in their, their intelligence, which was all a lie. It's all a complete fabrication. But the South is uh, getting more and more defensive about the issue of slavery. There's a lot more violence. And when I say violence here, uh, there's a recent uh, book has been out about uh, Congress and what the violence is going on there. And I knew about... Um, the, uh, the the issue between um, uh, about Senator Sumner, and we'll talk about him later, and he got beaten in Congress by Preston Brooks. He was beaten up in Congress. But because of this book, I'm even like uh, broadening my horizons on this. There were at least 60 events of actual violence in Congress, and it was almost all over slavery. Southerners like being really defensive about slavery and resorting to violence to defend their position. Knives, gunshots, beatings, it's crazy 
there's a lot of violence being exhibited, not towards the slaves in this case, but, but towards northerners who are trying to come down in the south and like say bad things about slavery or exhibiting all this abolitionism. The south won't put up with it. So there's all sorts of propaganda. It increases dramatically through the 1850s. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what are we heading towards? In the macro, step by step, bit by bit, slavery is driving us toward the Civil War. That is an absolute fact. So, in conclusion, what case did the South make? Not what case I'm making. I'm a fire abolitionist like all of you are. But what case did the South make? The North case was slavery is evil, which is true. They made a moral case of it. The South made a sociological and an economic case of it. But the North wasn't hearing it. They weren't interested in that. Now, we're going to talk about the labor force of the North later on. But the South made the sociological and economic case, and they said, we're going to keep our slaves. It's my position, and it was the position of the South at the time, that the war was fought over slavery. The South said so. And it's during the 1840s, right through the 1850s to 1860, when the South really does like bear down and knuckle down and get really defensive about holding on to their slaves no matter what. Now, again, later on, I'll have a series of presentations that talks about what was the South ready, willing, and able to do to hold on to slavery. And the answer is almost anything. That's a thesis statement for another um, series of slides that I will have on down the line. So I'm kind of presaging that right now. And be prepared for that statement later on. So that's all I have to say on uh, slavery for now. We will like bring this up a little bit later on. What we're going to talk about next is the Missouri Compromise. And then we'll talk about the Jackson administration. So we're almost done with uh, the age of Jackson, part one, two, and three. We're almost done with part one. Let's talk for a few minutes about the Missouri Compromise. Now, the Missouri Compromise, despite what you may think, is only peripherally about slaves. It's not about the slaves. It really isn't. It's about power. Strong note here. There are only two things that are important about power. I'm sorry, there are only two things that are important about politics. Power and money. There are only two things that are important in politics. Power and money. And the Missouri Compromise is about the balance of power. Now, I'll have a map up in a moment, and that will explain things much better. So the Missouri Compromise, it was um, suggested in 1819, adopted in, I'm sorry, 1819. It was uh, suggested, adopted in 1820. In other words, it took a long time to get this through Congress. And this is an effort to limit slavery, but the South wasn't having it. They wanted slavery everywhere, and the North was starting to wake up to the idea that they don't want the extension of slavery. More and more states are entering the Union, and this begins to create an imbalance, or threatens to create an imbalance. So the deal was that Missouri, of which there were a lot of slaves in Missouri, as it turns out, right across the border in Illinois, there's a lot of slaves over there as well. But that's beginning to thin out. Anyway, there was a lot of slaves in Missouri, and so Missouri, a new state from those that western territory, the old Northwest, they're going to enter as a slave state. Now, that should ring a bell. You know, the, the Northwest Ordinance, 1787, said there will be no slaves in the Old Northwest, of which Missouri was basically a part. It's one of the states that came out of the Northwest ter Territory, which is part of the Northwest Ordinance. Well, since there was a lot of slaves in there, Missouri is going to come in in violation of the Northwest Ordinance. And that's going to be allowed. But in return, Maine is going to be split from Massachusetts. Now, in all of our discussions up until this point, you've never heard me use the phrase, the state of Maine or the colony of Maine. That did not exist. Maine had always been part of the area, which is Maine today, had always been a part of Massachusetts. But it's going to be split off from Massachusetts, and it's going to be brought in as a free state. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this means there's a balance in Congress, especially in the Senate. It's not on there, but it's a balance in the Senate. Listen to me carefully. Listen to me very carefully here and write a very, very strong note. In Congress, the North is always going to be able to control the House of Representatives. 
Now, the party might change. Most of the time, it's going to be the Democratic Party still going to control Congress. But that's because there's a lot of northern conservatives. But the north is always going to control the House of Representatives because they had the greater population by far. The North is always going to have the greater population, all the way back to colonial times. So the South had kind of had a lot of influence in the Senate. But now the power is exactly equal. There are 12 southern states and 12 northern states. And so, because each state gets two senators, the balance of power in the Senate is exactly equal. And that's what the Missouri Compromise is all about. Now, continue on with strong notes. The South was always pretty confident that they would be able to control the executive. And that, as it turns out, uh, is basically true. Um, from right up to the Civil War, uh, you had uh, John Quincy, John Adams and John Quincy Adams. They were the only northern presidents. Everybody else was either from a border state that was pro-southern or from a southern state. They were either from Virginia or Tennessee or Kentucky or someplace like that. So for the most part, the South controlled the executive, and they were pretty confident about that going forward. Now, as time goes on, that's not going to be the case. So this is, one, this is what makes the Missouri Compromise important now. It's very, very Jacksonian, and it's very important now. We're already establishing this idea that the South is so paranoid about their controlling slavery that they're willing to have to cut these deals. And the North is starting to feel the pressure. They don't want the spread of slavery. So the Missouri Compromise is an artificial limitation on the spread of slavery. And it's only going to work for a while. But it preserves the balance of power in the Senate. So with that, let's go forward and take a look at the map. So what the Missouri Compromise does is it gives us this artificial boundary, and it's called the 3630 line. So Missouri is admitted as a slave state, but as you can see, it's part of the old Northwest. And that's a violation of the Northwest Territory, so they made a deal. So Missouri, that had a lot of slaves in it, they could come in as a slave state, and Missouri is going to be admitted, I'm sorry, Maine is going to be admitted as a free state. And so you have 12 states in the north. And that means 24 senators for the north and 12 states in the south. That means 24 senators for the south. Here is the problem. Ah, strong note here. A new slave state cannot come in unless a free state can come in at the same time. And a new free state cannot enter the union unless a slave state is ready to enter as well. But look at the map. There is virtually no room for another slave state to come into the Union. But that kind of purple color up there where it says organized, unorganized territory, there's lots and lots of room for new free states to enter the Union, which is exactly what's going to happen. Iowa will later on will enter. Michigan is going to split up and you're going to get uh, Wisconsin and part of Minnesota. They're going to like come into the Union. And so there's lots and lots of area for new free states to enter the Union. But there's almost no area for Southern or slave states to enter the Union because that part of America, the South, of which Texas, Oklahoma, and all those other Western states, that still belongs to Spanish Mexico. So the South can see, they can read a map as well. And they know that sooner or later they're going to get out of balance. Things are going to get out of balance. And then they're going to have to come up with another compromise. So we talk about the Missouri Compromise. I have it on there. It's effective until 1854. And then it'll be replaced by other compromises. So in that sense, what the Missouri Compromise does is it prevents the Civil War in 1820-1821. It prevents the Civil War from taking place in 1820-1821. Everybody knows there's going to be a power problem on down the line, but they're kicking the can down the road. And that's fine. They made a compromise. That's one of the strengths of American pop politics, is that we can always reach a compromise. So that's what I want you guys to know about the Missouri Compromise. It just has to do with control of power in Congress. It doesn't really have anything to do with slavery. Everybody understands the potential problem, 
But the Missouri Compromise is about power, not about slavery. So with that in mind, uh, let's move on to the last slide in this series, and that is uh, the Jackson administration. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. Uh, Jackson as a president, even to this day, uh, kind of controversial. Um, but let's just kind of go over his presidency in broad terms. Now, I did this with Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison. And then we kind of skipped all these other presidents until we get to um, Jackson. In other words, I didn't go over um, Monroe. I didn't really talk about JQA, John Quincy Adams. But here we are with uh, Andrew Jackson himself. Now, he's president from 1829 to 1837. The next bullet point I have on there is election dispute to landslide. So the previous president elected in 1825 is John Quincy Adams. And that is John Adams' son, his oldest son. Now, Jackson had run for president in that election in 1824 for the 1825 presidential year. And he had lost. But he kept on disputing the election. He kept on saying, no, I won, I won, I won, I won. Jackson wanted to be the president really, really badly. He wanted that. So Jackson immediately put all of his people on the case of getting him elected in the next year, in the next, in the next, pres in the next presidential election. So everything that John Quincy Adams did, Jackson or his people, his agents, disputed it. If John Quincy Adams said, listen, the sky is blue, uh, Jackson and his people would come out and say, that's unpatriotic. The sky is azure. If John Quincy Adams said, listen, water is wet, Jackson and his people would be out there saying, listen, no, water's only really, really moist. So no matter what John Quincy, Ad uh, John Quincy Adams, JQA, no matter what he said, Jackson and his people were out there arguing and debating and making JQA put him on the defensive. So in 1829, John Quincy Adams will go for re-election, and he's going to be beat in a landslide. That is to say, Jackson won in an overwhelming majority. So he's the first post-revolutionary. Uh, John Quincy Adams was a young man during the Revolutionary War, uh, but he's associated with John Adams, and so uh, he's kind of associated with that. But um, Andrew Jackson, would, he'd be just a kid, a teenager, uh, during the American War of Independence. And so he's not associated with the revolution anymore. He's also the first Westerner. He is from Virginia originally, but he moved out to Tennessee as a young man. And so he's considered a Westerner. And he's the first one of those. And he's also a nationalist. Now, the South put him into power and he's going to go into power as a Democrat, but he's a very, very conservative individual. Again, we've talked about that before. He's a conservative Democrat. And the South's going to put him in there, and he's going to be very pro-slavery. And uh, as we're going to see, he's going to deal with uh, Indian removal, which the South really, really wanted. So very briefly, he's going to end the National Bank. Now, I pointed out before when we talked about uh, Jefferson that anyone, anytime one of these presidents get in, talking about weak central government and strong states, the minute they get in, they want to exhibit a lot of power. And a good example of that is ending the National Bank. Now, John Quincy Adams had re-chartered uh, the National Bank, the second National Bank. And he chartered it for 25 years, and that was going to like go over Andrew Jackson's administration. And Jackson knew it. So the way Jackson goes about destroying the bank is he does it this way, strong note here. Now, your book will talk about this a lot. So please make sure you read your textbook on this event on this as well. The banking controversy is going to be a big, big idea all the way through the rest of the 1800s, the 19th century. And so the way Jackson gets rid of it is he starts taking deposits out of the National Bank. And using his own presidential authority, he puts it into state banks. So he'll take a bunch of money out of the National Bank and put it in a bank in, say, let's say, the state of Georgia. And the people of the state of Georgia, they're like, yeah, hooray for that. We have this huge jump deposit in the state bank, and that stabilized the bank. Well, you might think, well, the North is going to like cry out about that. They're not going to like it. So Jackson would say, well, he understood this. And he'd take a lot of money out of the National Bank and put it in the bank of, let's say, New York. And 
And that would shut up the New Yorkers. And they'd put money in Tennessee State Bank and then in Massachusetts. And so you'd go from northern state to southern state, taking a vast treasure of money out of the national bank and putting it into the state banks. And so this stabilized, this helped to stabilize the state banks. But it destabilized the national bank. It destabilized the national bank. And as I'm going to point out later on, this is going to lead to a boom and bust economy, which happens a lot. But the National Bank had always been able to, like, sort it out. They'd always been a stabilizing tool in the economy. And now that tool is gone. Well, Jackson happens to have an up economy as he's well on his way out the door. And so everybody said, well, this Jackson's a genius. That destabilizing the National Bank, that was a good idea. Because now the economy is booming. And the economy was booming, but for a different reason. Because when Martin Van Buren comes in, he immediately has to deal with a huge, giant economic downturn, a crash. But the National Bank was destabilized, and so he did not have that tool. So when we think about ending the National Bank in this case, please understand that Jackson is using federal central government power to actually do that. Let's talk about tariffs very briefly. Now, the South did not want tariffs. They absolutely wanted protectionist. And that seems to be a Federalist idea. But what the South was worrying about was a retaliation tax. In other words, a tariff, as you all know, is an import or an export tax. The North wanted a tariff because they wanted to try to build the textile industry. And to do that, they had wanted a tax on cheap, high-quality British textiles, woven cloth. They wanted the big giant tariff on that. And they kept screaming about that. They said, listen, if we put this tariff on this cloth, that will give our clothing industry, our cloth industry, an opportunity to get ahead, to build the necessary infrastructure, instead of having to compete with inexpensive, high-quality British stuff. But the South said, listen, if you put a tariff on British clothing, the British will in turn put a tariff on southern cotton, and that will destroy the southern economy. The South was exporting millions of bales a year of cotton, mostly to England. And so they didn't want the tariff because they were afraid of a retaliatory tariff. So again, Jackson uses federal power to solve this. He says to the North, Okay, you're going to get your tariff. It'll be 7 or 8 or 10%, but only for a couple of years. And then, after two or three years of 7 or 10% tariff, then it's going to go down to five, 4 to 5%, and then down to 3%. And then two or three years later after that, it's going to go down to zero. So you're going to get your tariff, but only with a short lifespan. And he said to the South, listen, you guys got to be prepared for a retaliatory tariff, which actually did not happen. But you only have to put up with that for a very short period of time. So again, Jackson's very good at thinking about the national interest. That's why I have him up there as a nationalist. He's prepared to work with the North, and he's prepared to work with the South. Now, at the end of his administration, he did have a budget surplus. And that's going to be about the last time we don't have to really contend with the national debt. Uh, Jackson did not like a national debt. He tried to like pay down the national debt and get rid of it, and he was able to secede at the very end of his administration. And that's the last time in American history that we have basically no national debt. However, it turns out that that's destabilizing. Again, uh, Martin Van Buren had to contend with that later. A scandal, very briefly on this, uh, this is called the Kitchen Cabinet. And again, your book will talk about this a lot. There was the Peggy Eaton Affair. And then there was the kitchen cabinet. Now, the Peggy Eaton affair, a lot of my colleagues will make a big deal out of that, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. But it is in your book, and I want you to read about it. The Peggy Eaton affair. But the other scandal is a little bit more um, controversial, and I think it's important. It kind of gives you an idea of how Andrew Jackson operated. Now, he didn't get along with most of the people in his cabinet. He didn't get along with them. Uh, John C. Calhoun was his vice president. We've run into John C. Calhoun again, and we'll run into him again on down the line. We've run into him before, and we'll run into him again. 
And John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, he's very, very fiery. Uh, when the tariff came along, he threatened to secede from the Union then, take South Carolina and go. It didn't amount to anything. Nobody else wanted to like leave the Union over this tariff. Nobody was going to do that. Andrew Jackson said if anybody did leave the Union, he would put on his uniform as a general in the Army. And as the president, he would transform into an Army general. i go down there and beat the crap out of the South. But the whole idea of secession at the time fell apart anyway. But um, John C. Calhoun resigned as vice president and went back into the Senate. And so we're going to run into John C. Calhoun again. Martin Van Buren takes over as vice president, and Andrew Jackson will groom him and turn him into the president later on. But the scandal is the kitchen cabinet. So Jackson, he's a very strong personality, and he has this falling out with one cabinet secretary after another. So after a while, what emerges is, and this is what's scandalous, that he's getting with these drinking buddies and going down into the White House kitchen and playing poker and sipping whiskey and talking about national policy with his buddies, his cronies, instead of with his own cabinet who are responsible for national policy. Now that's scandalous enough, but what really outraged people is that he's making national policy right in front of the kitchen help. And nobody wanted that. You know, you're not supposed to be talking about national policy right in front of the help, right in front of the kitchen staff. But Jackson didn't care. And so this becomes very, very scandalous. Now, Indian removal, we'll talk about on a different series of slides. And so I'll have a whole presentation on nothing but Indian removal. But that began during Jackson's administration. Uh, for those of you guys who've done one, there's actually uh, one of those essay response papers, an extra credit paper that deal with Jackson and Indian removal. And you'll find, and I will point this out again later on, that he's very, very uh, duplicitous about this. But Indian removal is part of the age of Jackson. Last but not least, Martin Van Buren. Again, uh, we're not going to talk very much about Martin Van Buren. Uh, Jackson's going to put him in as the next president when he's out at the end of his second administration. Uh, Martin Van Buren is in. And what I really want you to know about Martin Van Buren is he had to clean up this gigantic mess that Jackson left. Jackson leaves an economy that's okay, but then immediately has a crash. But then Van Buren does not have the tools necessary to fix it. Uh, Martin Van Buren has to deal with Indian removal. That began under Jackson. Jackson got it all set up. But then it's Martin Van Buren who actually had to do it. He had to execute that policy. And that gave him a really, really bad name. And so... Martin Van Buren emerges as one of the worst presidents we've ever had. He is not the worst. That is James Buchanan. But he has a very, very bad reputation. It's not because Martin Van Buren was a bad president, but all of these wrecks that Jackson left, when he left office, all those wrecks were still there, and Martin Van Buren had to solve it. So that's really all I have to say about uh, Jackson and his administration himself. But he did put his stamp on this entire era from 1825 really through to the 1840s. And he's this towering political figure uh, that will have an influence all the way out to uh, really the 1850s, but certainly through the 1840s. So with that in mind, uh, let's close off our discussion. The next slide is just a lead in uh, to uh, the next uh, discussion, which is the Age of Jackson, part two. So the America of Jackson, uh, part two of three, or part two and three, I guess I should say, moving forward, antebellum slavery, we talked about that. Uh, so uh, part two, we'll talk about Indian removal and a little bit about the Industrial Revolution, which is steam uh, powered by sea and by land. And then I'll talk about the cost of that. Then part three will be basically uh, manifest destiny and what that means, and we will achieve manifest destiny with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago and the Mexican War of 1848. That will be part three. So thank you for your time. Again, don't get confused. There's several other part ones and parts twos. This is America, the age of Jackson. You're looking for part two and then later on part three.